So my name is Lee Clarich. I'm the Chief Product Officer for Powell's Networks. Um, have been with Powell's Networks since essentially the beginning of the company, so about 17 years now. Um, during that time, I've obviously had a, an opportunity to see just amazing change and in innovation in cybersecurity. And in my role leading products, of course, I spent a lot of time thinking about how to understand the latest in, uh, in, in security threats and challenges, et cetera, and how to translate that in technology, technology in a product, and, and there's a lot um, that we're obviously focused on. I thought for today, what I would share with you and, um, and focus on is really um, three areas that I believe are both very topical for all of you, but also certainly uh, incredibly important in terms of where we're driving innovation in our products and technology. Okay. Um, now, in many ways, I would almost say these, these have started to feel very much like buzzwords. I'm going to try to steer clear of that when I actually talk about what we're doing and how we think about this. But you, know, you think more broadly, you know, zero trust fully expanded into like it, it, it fully disrupts in a, in a good way network security at large. Supply chain security fully disrupts how we think about securing the cloud. AI, of course, I, think, I feel like no, we can't stop talking about AI at this point, but um, I want to talk not so much about LLMs and all that kind of stuff, but talk about how AI can be used as a tool uh, to provide much better and more comprehensive security in, more, in a more automated fashion. And so um, these, of course, map to health networks and how we think about our products, technologies, and ultimately three platforms that we use to deliver uh, these capabilities. So network security and zero trust, uh, Prisma Cloud for cloud security, including supply chain security, and of course Cortex and security operations where we think about um, uh, AI and automation brought to life for defending all of our environments and networks. So if I start with network security and, and zero trust. So I want to start at a very simple stage. The, the concept of zero trust is not new. As I'm sure all of you are aware, the concept of zero trust dates back well over 10 years ago. And at that time, zero trust was a um, concept. Uh, John Kindervog actually was the one who, at least the first time I remember hearing it, talked about it in these terms. It was about um, changing access policy from being based on static attributes to be based on context. And the context mapped back to who is the user, what role do they have, et cetera, what application are they trying to reach? What device are they coming from? In some cases, additional context was brought, like geography and things like that. Data is a key piece of context. All of that is used to determine whether or not that connection should be allowed. Once it's allowed, how do you secure it to make sure the connection is safe? In concept, zero trust is actually very simple. Now, where it starts to become more challenging is when you realize that in order to get the benefits of a zero trust architecture, it has to be applied consistently across the entire enterprise. Every connection from every user to every application has to go through a zero trust uh, inspection process. That starts to get harder, particularly when you think about the fact that uh, employees are working from anywhere, connecting to applications that are increasingly host in the cloud, consumed as SaaS. You still have all the legacy applications as well, so you haven't given up anything, but you've gained a lot more that has to be secured. And so one of the big challenges that happens in this sort of expansion of what needs to be covered is this bifurcation of technology stacks. Hardware stacks still make sense for large campus environments and data center environments. Software form factors make sense when you think about public cloud and private cloud. SASE, of course, makes a lot of sense when you think about remote workforce and branch offices. And if you approach each of these as a separate technology stack, the, the likelihood of being able to accomplish a zero trust outcome is almost zero. It becomes so complicated to have consistent user experience, consistent security capabilities, consistent policy across all these environments. And so what we envisioned 
is an approach to zero trust where all of those different pieces are delivered as part of a cohesive platform. Where the form factor is just a delivery mechanism. In some cases, it's hardware. In some cases, it's software. In some cases, it's SASE. That's just the delivery mechanism. The part that actually matters is the software stack that sits on top of it, where applications and users and devices become context for policy, where all the security services are simply delivered as services that connect into any one of those form factors. And so when we take this approach, what we're able to accomplish is the only approach that I'm aware of that can truly deliver a zero trust enterprise architecture. One where all the security capabilities are best in class. One where these security services are truly integrated in sharing information between them so that context becomes even more powerful, both in policy as well as security. And very importantly, one where we keep in mind <laughs> that there is a reason we provide security, it's, it's to enable the mission or the business to an outcome that is often highly dependent on the productivity of the workforce. And so doing all of this in such a way that it actually enhances the productivity, not reduces it. Now, in this approach, there's a few things that become really important. One, each of these form factors is actually really important. Each one has to be best in class on its own. We have to have best in class hardware. We have to have best in class software. We have to be best in class at SASE, even independently. And I understand there's a, there's actually, I was gonna say there's a lot. Pretty much every environment in the world is heterogeneous. So we understand that to some extent they have to be able to work independently. But I believe fundamentally they have to increasingly be delivered from the same software stack. And just to, to dive into the SASE piece just a little bit more because of how important it is. The key aspect with SASE is, in addition to everything I just said, it has to be able to serve a number of different use cases. It has to be able to serve the use case of remote workers accessing internal applications at a data center. It has to serve the use case of those same employees connecting to cloud-based applications. It has to serve the use case of those employees going out to the internet and doing and accessing applications there that are outside of the boundary. So much of the time we think of these different use cases as independent projects, but they all come back together. They all have to come together again in order for that user experience to be consistent and secure. Now, the second key aspect to all of this is, if you think about how much effort goes into making sure that everything I just talked about, all the form factors are deployed, they're in the right places, they're passing traffic, they're resilient, they're, they're configured correctly, all of that work. And then along comes a new security requirement. And what do you do? You go out, you talk to the, maybe the five vendors, the 10 vendors that are, you know, the startups, they're the ones who presumably are really good at whatever the new thing is. You talk to them, they say, I always say the first thing, first thing I always say is gonna be the same. We're the best at blank, whatever blank is. And then you say, okay, great, how do I consume that new capability? They'll all say, it's really easy. All you have to do is deploy my network sensor everywhere that you want my, my capability to work. You're like, everywhere? It's a lot of places. And so what you see behind me is a set of security services that at various points over the last 10 to 15 years were all point products deployed on standalone hardware, standalone software, discrete from everything else in your network security stack. Yes? Yet every one of those for us is actually a security service that plugs into our next-gen firewall, whether that be hardware or software, or plugs into our SASE solution. So the next thing on the list will simply be a new service that plugs into the same infrastructure. And we've done this. We've, we've proven that we can do this. When, when we started, we had two security services. We now have eight. Every one of those additional security services plugs into that existing infrastructure. Now, 
On top of that, each of those security services has to be architected the right way. Now, what you see here is how our security services are architected. They're architected and designed both for true um, uh, network effect scale. On a typical day, we will collect about three and a half billion unique events to be analyzed. The word event is meant to be a little bit ambiguous. This could be files, this could be domains, this could be URLs, this could be uh, little snippets of traffic. Three and a half billion unique events, meaning not, dupli not duplicates, in a day. So that's the network effect benefit. The second piece then is when we analyze it, we're not just analyzing against signatures and databases of what we've already seen. We of course do that, but we're using inline machine learning models, so a form of AI, to detect new zero day attacks. And in fact, in a typical day, we will identify about 275,000 new attacks that we had not seen before new unique attacks we've not seen before. We stop those, we add that to what we know, and when you combine all that together in a typical day, we will block about five billion attacks. So what you're seeing is the power of the network effect, so being able to see and analyze uh, events from all over the world to be the first to see and detect a new attack. Two, you're seeing the ability to run machine learning models in line so that detection actually is prevention. And three, you're seeing the scale. The scale of being able to prevent just about every known attack that we've ever seen. This is important because it forces attackers to then move up the, the, the scale toward it creating net new attacks. We want to make this as hard as we possibly can. Okay. So that gives you a sense for how we think, take zero trust and expand the scope to thinking about it holistically across the entire enterprise and applying technology in new ways. Now, second area is around supply chain and how we talk about and think about cloud security. Now, you may wonder why I'm connecting the two and I'll, I'll get there in a second. You think about applications and how they used to be deployed in a data center, everything kind of moved a bit slow, kind of on purpose, lots of process, policy governance and things like that. As applications started moving to the cloud, things opened up. Processes started to become much more streamlined, much more automatic, things became much more dynamic. There are environments where an application running in the cloud might change, meaning new code being pushed to it hundreds of times a day. Just to give you a sense of where the cloud has enabled this very dynamic uh, mission-driven focus on what, what is needed, what is needed, how do I deliver it as fast as I possibly can. And a lot of those same techniques have worked their way back into private cloud environments as well. This is wonderful in many ways. The challenge with this though is how do you secure it? And the traditional method of every security need gets a set of products that focus on delivering that one capability does not work. Having said that, it is what is currently being tried for the most part in the industry. If you look around most cloud security companies, they're focused on solving one problem, maybe two, and then all of the other problems require another product, another product, another product. This is massively complicated. And when you think about combining complex with a highly dynamic and automated cloud environment, that does not go together very well. Now, it's also important to note that these are not easy things to do. So even within any one of these solutions, there is a level of complexity because the cloud is complex. This is what IAM in the cloud looks like. This is definitely not solvable by having SOC analysts or cloud security analysts simply look at configuration, decide whether it's good or not, right? Now think about how you connect this with everything else that happens in the cloud. We have to have a different approach. So as, as we think about cloud, I always try to simplify things before I make them complicated again. 
So I think about it in three main aspects. The first, and sort of foundational, is how do we get visibility and control over the cloud infrastructure itself? How do we make sure that everything in the cloud is at least configured correctly, good hygiene, nothing obvious messed up, right? It's actually hard, but a very good starting point. It's not sufficient, but it's a very good starting point. This is actually where most organizations are when it comes to security in the cloud. The second piece is, so let me back up for a second. When you, when you start to approach this, one of the things that I think this is about 100% of the time, and I talk to a lot of companies, 100% of the time, the, what they find in this approach is they find all sorts of things that are misconfigured. And the first thing they do is they start to prioritize that list and, and they go back to the developers and they say, we need you to fix this, we need you to fix this, we need you to fix this. And so everyone goes off and they run and start fixing those things. Before they know it, a whole new batch of issues comes in because the next applications are deployed or the next, next updates are rolled out and things break all over again. So they fixed 1,000, but 2,000 new issues came in. They fixed 1,000 and 5,000 new issues came in. It's a losing battle. So what, what, what everyone finds is, they go, how do, I, how do I like clean up the stuff that's coming into my production cloud environment? Shift left, if you've heard of that term, is basically the idea that says, let me do as much of my cloud security while it is still in development and, and DevOps stage before it goes into production. If you do that really well, then what actually comes in and gets deployed is already clean. So you fix a thousand things, almost nothing else comes in, you're actually starting to bring down and create a much cleaner, more secure cloud environment. If you do that really well, then you reach the third piece. Because attackers will still attack the cloud, how do you then provide runtime security against all the different ways that an attacker is going to try to attack a cloud that is hopefully, everything else is done really well, hopefully it's configured well, it's configured securely, you have to deal with then with things like exploits and malware and all this kind of stuff. So this is, this is my view of what needs to happen in the cloud. Now, in order to do this, there's a whole bunch of different capabilities that are needed. And for us, the way we think about this is, instead of these being point products that were not designed to work together, these become modules delivered from a single platform. As such, they are pre-integrated. <laughs> they are pre-integrated with the rest of the platform. They're pre-integrated in terms of sharing context with the other modules. They're pre-integrated in terms of how the operational um, uh, bring up works. So now you start to see familiar terms, things like CSPM, uh, CIEM, these are very common within the visibility and control within the cloud. Shift left, infrastructure as code, so how do you analyze Terraform templates and cloud formation templates to make sure that they are secure before they start replicating deployment configuration in the cloud. SCA, this is how we analyze uh, open source code and make sure it's safe, the right versions, et cetera. SAST, secret scanning, et cetera. And then of course, runtime protection, malware analysis uh, prevention, exploit prevention, et cetera, et cetera. So, this now starts to give you a sense of, starting with these three main areas of focus, how we're able to deliver a comprehensive set of cloud security capabilities as modules from a platform pre-integrated. And, and the, the benefits of this are immense, right? Our own uh, organization, we, we are a very large, uh, um, cloud consumer, cloud user in terms of the services we build and deploy. And we have done exactly what I just described. We started in the first column of getting visibility control. We figured out very quickly we had to shift left. We built out an incredibly efficient shift left program so that everything gets deployed into production has already gone through all our security checks. And then a very comprehensive best in class runtime protection capability. Now, The open source code aspect of that is one aspect of supply chain. The next thing that we will be releasing in Prisma Cloud covers another aspect of supply chain. So in almost every um, environment that is using cloud, there's something called CICD. So this is basically explaining how an application is developed and all the tools and applications that are needed in order to develop that application often is made up of a series of third-party uh, tools, third-party applications. These are what the developers use, this is what the DevOps teams use to actually develop and deploy applications. It is not uncommon to have hundreds 
of third-party applications and tools in a development environment for the cloud. The challenge is that any one of those third-party applications can present a risk, and even more so, present, presents a risk from the inside out, right? So obviously, we all know of things like SolarWinds being an example of this. There's actually a fairly long list of examples where third-party tools, third-party applications were compromised themselves, and because of where they're deployed and what they have access to, it creates a compromise from the inside out. And so the next module of Prisma Cloud that we will be releasing um, is focused on CI CD security. It's focused on all of these different applications that are used in the development of applications for the cloud and making sure that the, all of those applications are deployed securely, configured securely, connected in a secure fashion, and that we can proactively expose any risks that we see based on how they're being used. So this will expand the notion of supply chain security as it pertains to cloud. Okay, talked about zero trust, we talked about supply chain. AI, AI and automation in the context of security operations. So um, I believe the SOC is a mess. I believe it's fundamentally broken. The tool that is most often relied on is the SIM. It's become the least useful tool in the SOC from my perspective. This is why things like EDR exist, NTA, UEBA, ITDR, CDR is a new term. I'm throwing acronyms because I assume you're all, all familiar with acronyms. <laughs> maybe I'm, I'm giving some new ones. Um, uh, ITDR, so Identity Threat Detection Response, sort of the new form of UEBA, so User and Entity Behavioral Analytics. CDR, Cloud Detection Response, kind of like EDR, but in the cloud. You could kind of throw IoT security into this bucket. It has elements that are related to this. So where do you go for your intelligence? Here. Is it the SIM? Is it the EDR tool? Is it the NTA tool? Right? This is why I believe this doesn't work. So we've been looking at this and we've been approaching this by saying, all right, let's solve the three core pieces. First, can we solve the analytics piece? Can we bring the different data sources, endpoint, network, identity, cloud, can we bring the different data sources together and do analytics once? That would be much more intelligent by being able to see the entire picture when we do analytics as opposed to separating. So this is where the, the key piece of AI is happening. Second part is, can we start to automate a lot of the repetitive tasks? There's a tremendous amount of repetition, manual repetition that's happening in the SOC. So we've approached that with XOR, and then as the panel was just describing with Expanse and attack surface management, how do we become more and more proactive as opposed to always being reactive to new threats? So XGR is actually a category that um, we were the first company to come out with an XGR product. A little over three years ago, we launched Cortex XDR, and since that time, we've just been on a, 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 I don't know, a, a tear in terms of the innovation we've been delivering on top of this platform where, where we combine uh, best-in-class EDR capabilities and endpoint data with network data, with identity data, with cloud data. We bring those data sources together. We drive our analytics and AI capabilities. Um, we've had a number of cases where we've um, been able to not just detect attacks, new attacks, zero-day attacks as they happen, but actually are able to prevent them because We've figured out a way to take the AI that we do in the cloud for analytics and actually uh, build AI-based capabilities back into the agent, we call it behavior threat, uh, uh, threat prevention rules. Uh, we were actually able to prevent solar winds when it happened, the 3CX, which just came out recently, if you're paying attention to that. We have preventions that date back a month before that was ever discovered because we're preventing the techniques that attackers are using. In XOR, we've had tremendous success automating these repetitive tasks away. We've seen organizations where the number of alerts they deal with have gone down by 95% or more in some cases by using automation. We've seen SOCs that have seen increases in efficiency of 30% or more based on the automation that XOR can bring. 
tremendously powerful. And Expanse, which you heard about just recently, and the importance of understanding the attack surface proactively and having, a, having the opportunity to address any issues before attackers find them. And make no mistake, with, with hybrid work and the shift to cloud, the attack surface has dramatically increased. And attackers have become very good at using automation as a tool in their toolkit for how they find exposed attack surface very quickly. So not only is the accuracy of identifying the attack surface important, but the speed to remediation becomes incredibly important as well. And so about four or five months ago now, we launched Active ASM, which focuses the, the key word there being active. Like how do we automate as much of the, uh, not just the detection, but the remediation of attack surface. And what you're seeing here is the difference between simply saying, here's a bunch of issues, you should go fix them, to here's a bunch of issues, and here's a set of integrated, automated playbooks that can be run to remediate issues. What you're seeing here is an example, ransomware attackers are almost always going after RDP uh, connections and servers as a mechanism for, for gaining uh, a foothold. When an RDP server is exposed, using automation, we have customers that are now automatically remediating that, remediating that in minutes versus the old approach, which often was very manual, very process oriented, that could take hours to weeks, depending on the size and scope of the organization. Weeks down to minutes is the difference potentially between breach and protection. Okay, now, as we were thinking about this and we were solving these, these different problems in the SOC with three different products, we are looking and saying, you know what, the SOC actually needs to be fully transformed. We have to actually approach this from the ground up. How would we do that? Well, we would take all these data sources and we would integrate them together. And we'd use that integrated data to drive the AI uh, engines for detection of attacks and prioritization and scoring and everything else. We would then take that and we would automate everything that comes after it. And ultimately, we hope the SOC would be happy. Um, the, and as we're thinking about this, say like, okay, this is the right approach. We started to build this. We started to build this um, uh, a couple years ago based on the foundation of what I just shared with you. And about a year ago, we launched XIM, which is our vision for the future SOC of the world, one that is fully transformed through AI and automation, where we can take all data sources while having opinions about what the good data sources are for driving analytics, but we can take all data sources. We could integrate that data together, drive a series of analytics that are focused on different types of attacks, bring the, all of that together with automation, bring all of the context that expanse attack surface management can give us in terms of being proactive as well, bring all of that together into one single platform. We were customer number one, as we often are, as you would probably hope we should be. In our own SOC, on a typical day, we will see about 36 billion unique logs, events, alerts come in, 36 billion. It's about 50, 50 plus terabytes of data per day that we're ingesting. After all of the different analytics, the AI, the automation, and everything else, we'll get down to a, um, between a handful to maybe a little bit over 100 different potential incidents that our SOC team has to actually investigate and deal with. And even then, they're still using a lot of automation in their uh, investigation response. As a result of all of this, our mean time detection, mean time response, respond, is measured in seconds to a minute. These are the kinds of outcomes that we believe every SOC can achieve and should achieve. But this will only happen when we are able to ingest all of the right data together into the right kind of platform that can then drive AI-based analytics 
in automation-based outcomes. Now, not everyone is quite ready for that, so the XDR, XOR expanse are all built, designed as on-ramps to the full platform. So many of you are actually even already on this journey, potentially, to a full SOC transformation. Now, I'll just leave you with one last thing. Um, I've been in cybersecurity for a long time, um, and one of the things I've, I've always understood is the importance of being able to connect innovations with the customer and what it takes for our customers to be able to consume a lot of these innovations. You know, many of the things I talked about today require new advances in, in how we think about leveraging cloud services with on-prem services and how we think about air-gapped environments and all this other kind of stuff. Um, I just want to share with you like how, one, how deeply I as the leader of the product organization and everyone in my team understands how important things like these certifications and compliance standards and other things like that are, are to all of you being able to consume and take advantage of these innovations. This is something we think about very frequently, something I review actually on a weekly basis because of how important this is in ensuring that all of our latest innovations can be consumed and used by our customers. And so that's how we think about a lot of things in cybersecurity. How we, th how we think about zero trust um, and innovation in the broader network security platform. How we think about supply chain and how it, how it ties into the broader perspective on cloud security. And how we think about AI, not just as, you know, asking, you know, a large language model to spin out a sonnet for some reason, but actually how we think about AI and automation being truly powerful tools for all of us as we take on the attackers and come up with new and innovative ways to defend uh, all of our uh, critical resources, our people, our applications, our data from them. So with that, I'd like to say thank you all very much for your time.